Let us begin tonight with a scenario which there really is no right answer. It all depends on, as a policymaker, bureaucrat, or whatever, what your intention is in reference to protecting your population. Now, here we have a real world scenario. Those who had prior vaccination have 1.2 times more odds become positive when compared to patients who did not have a vaccination. And obviously we're talking SARS-CoV-2. This is a real world observation, but it is in India and they utilize different vaccines than we do here in the United States. But just the same, here is the scenario. Now you recognize the fact that for some odd reason, individuals, not necessarily statistically significant, keep in mind we have to carry that out later on to conclude further as the researcher said, but you have these safety signals popping up where the vaccinated are becoming far more positive than the non-vaccinated uh, or far more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 than the non-vaccinated, which can potentially mean they can become infectious. Now, because one's positive doesn't necessarily mean they're infectious, but there's usually a strong correlation. So if, you're, if your intention is basically to slow or stop transmission of the virus, would you continue your vaccine campaign? Now, the other thing you have to take into account is this as follows. Whoops, let me move forward up here a little bit is in least according to the study, those which are vaccinated are requiring less oxygen ICUs or less hospital care. But then again, you have to keep in mind those which are vaccinated appear to be more positive more often. So there's your scenario. If you're looking to slow or stop transmission, do you continue with your vaccine campaign? Uh, also, too, if it's just reduced hospital load, but you know by vaccinating people, there's going to be more individuals positive, and that can basically uh, not be, how would you say, productive in reducing your transmission rates. I'm trying to speak in a non censored terminology, but you get my point. As well as too, keep in mind, our study didn't find any protective effect of vaccination against new COVID-19 infections. Type of vaccine or number of doses has any effect on new infection. So basically, and on top of that, it looks like those which are vaccinated actually are more positive. So that creates an interesting scenario. So you, are you looking more to reduce hospital load or are you looking more to reduce transmission? And if you're looking to reduce hospital load, you know, then how long do you hold on to this mask and social distancing aspect? That's an interesting scenario, but we'll review this study in a little bit, but you got most of it right off the bat. And that's a real world um, observation from India in reference to the vaccines that they are using there. Covishield, and I just always call it, you know, Covaxin, but I always call it AstraZeneca's. But let's get right into the research as follows. All right, let's go, well, once again, let's just say this. Good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, biostatisticians, bioinformatics, epidemiologists, and our wonderful, 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 great data-orientated audience. So let us basically delve into a mild bit of selection bias as we begin to look at things from a different angle, which we don't get to see on the news. And here's our first element of selection bias. Does this selection bias mean we're wrong? I don't know. Let's look. There's zip file comparison size. All right. And what we're doing right here, for those not familiar, is we'll be keeping track of the vaccine adverse event reporting systems file size. Now, keep in mind before we go, it's a good time to get to our disclaimer. We're going to be covering VAERS, but any reports can contain information, may be incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, unverifiable. So, again, the self submitted information to VAERS. Uh, so it requires time to validate. But just the same, we are basically looking at information from ba, 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 this right here. So you see right here, zip file size, 128.63 megabytes. You see right there. And then you compare it to that the years there. 
do, 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 all the way down the line. And what we have is as follows. From January 2021 to today, September 20th, well, September 24th is when I actually uh, did this, but September 24th, 2021, all of the data from that time is 128.63 megabytes. So all the vaccine adverse event reports from January to close to today is larger than all of the vaccine adverse reports over the prior 30 years. It broke that threshold or we called it the Rubicon last week. And now I believe we are at 128.63 megabytes compared to 30 years worth of data at 122.53. So yeah, is that disconcerting? Yeah. Does the CDC have the personnel in order to review these various uh, files for these, uh, what we call safety signals? If you look at the disclaimer, uh, I don't know. No one's appeared to answer that question. But again, there's a lot of data and you have more than 30 years worth of data, basically file size wise, piled in between this year compared to 1990 to 2020. And you know, the CDC had a lot of work covering the data from 1990 to 2020 over 30 years. Imagine having that same file size and now you got to go through it within a few months. And then on top of that, you get FDA approval for stuff. When your vaccine adverse reaction reports are the file size is that much larger. So again, that's the caveat. Our research we're looking at as falls outside of the data. I just wanted to cover that ahead of time so people didn't have to wait because I know they've been looking for that as far as um, as far as getting an idea of the uh, the complexity of the situation at hand. But here we are. We'll be looking at do, 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 equivalency of protection from natural immunity in COVID-19. We'll be reviewing the vitamin D, the socioeconomic deprivation, mediated COVID-19 ethic health disparities. Well, everything's popping up there. There's that. Uh, basically, we looked at that. We'll just review that on saline solution. can inhibit replication of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the effectiveness of, we just looked at India study right there. We'll come back to that in a little bit. We'll be looking at wonderful, wonderful study, which I don't know how it got passed up, but it is, let's get right to the top here. Uh, computational system, uh, systematics of nutritional support of vaccination against viral and bacterial pathogens and so on and so forth against COVID-19. I had to speak it's late at night. I don't have to pronounce it. Uh, effects of testing and vaccination levels, the dynamic of COVID-19 pandemic and prospects of its termination. Yeah, 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 not great. All right, the study's great. I meant the prospects of termination. No, nah, it's gonna be, looks like it's endemic. A study shows that the effectiveness of ozone is a disinfectant agent against SARS-CoV-2 in public transport. One of many wonderful studies that can inhibit uh, at least for my transmission, I suppose. But regardless of that, ozone works well too. And they gave a great explanation of how it works. All right, this is just a great, I just wanna show you the map here. And let's do this right now. Cause estimates of presumed population immunity of SARS-CoV-2 by state in the United States, August, 2021. This is gonna be for those individuals, the researchers uh, that wanna look at data uh, per se, that is really compiled well in reference to vaccines or not vaccinated. So this is the legend previously inv- uh, previously infected. I don't know if you could read that in the 4K. Let me move that up there. Let's see if I can make this a little larger. There it is. All right, there's that. So I don't know why <laughs> you expected to have a little bit uh, better clarity, but there's legend of individuals previously uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the darker the color, the more people that had been infected prior and then percent vaccinated. And I'm gonna move this, the hand off there so you can see it easier. So right here is your previously infected, right there is your percent vaccinated. It's not gonna say much and we probably won't come back to the study as is, but I wanna have the link available uh, for individuals so they can get a good basis down as far as looking at you know, policy and probabilities and so on and so forth reference that data. I have no clue how large, large states uh, have not had uh, missing or insufficient data, 
I mean, Maine, Vermont, Texas. I mean, seriously, come on. All right, and let's go back down. We'll also be covering two. Uh, acceleration of vaccine status in France, real interesting study. Uh, this one, we're going to go down to here. This is basically one ready we'll go to is comparison of adverse events between COVID-19 and flu vaccines. This gives you a real solid perspective of the dynamics, the difference between the two in reference to the reaction and what to watch out for purely from a statistical standpoint. And they as well uh, used VAERS themselves. And we'll reiterate that disclaimer once again when we get to the study as is. So let's get right into the research as follows. And we go boom. Equivalency protection from natural immunity in COVID-19 versus fully vaccinated persons, a systemic, a systematic, systemic. You can tell what I've been reading. The systematic review and pooled analysis. Oh, one. All right, so what are we looking at here? This has been a pretty heavily uh, pulled study from uh, the, some of the blogs that I manage. I'm just going to read some of the excerpts. Just so you can get an idea, again, the objective is not for me to go through the research line by line with you. The objective is just to bring attention to it. And this is really playing a large role in reference to a lot of the vaccine mandates, whether, uh, you know, it's really worth the, um, the effort. Let's just put it that way. Let's just read the conclusion here. Our review demonstrates that natural immunity in COVID recovered individuals is at least equivalent to the protection afforded by full vaccination of COVID naive populations. There is a modest and incremental relative benefit to vaccination in COVID recovered individuals. However, the net benefit is marginal on an absolute basis. COVID recovered individuals represent a distinctly different benefit risk calculus. Therefore, vaccination of COVID recovered individuals should be subject to clinical equipoise in individual preference. So basically, what they're concluding is there are different types of immunity, and it's actually pretty good. So let's scroll down. In the United States, the Centers for Disease Control currently recommends vaccinations in previously infected individuals without exception. Very draconian because obviously, if the previously infected are showing pretty strong signs of immunity, and this just seems to be something which is almost childlike. But I can understand the concern. But however, though, with the data as it begins to uh, evolve, it's quite interesting. Oh, you see right here? It's interesting, too, as far as who funded it. So this can't exactly be interested, uh, inserted as um, fake news, all right? Especially since considering the fact of who's funding it, it's, it's, it's cute. But to proceed... The report a series of 17,126 healthcare workers in the UK and found 0% risk of reinfection compared to a 2.9% positivity rate, resulting in a 100% risk reduction due to prior infection. All right. So what ends up happening is they're going to go through a lot of data as such as far as reinfection rates. And so there's almost think of it like a, uh, a, a, you know, it's a systematic review, meta-analysis, however you want to cover it. So you want to delve into the data and try to make an argument saying, hey, well, the, the people which are infected before uh, obviously have a higher risk of infection than zero. All right. You see what I mean? So why, you know, the first, what is it, the oath, the Hippocratic Oath, is do no harm. So aren't, isn't a violation Hippocratic Oath if you're vaccinating a person that doesn't need to be vaccinated? And then you're, all you're doing is exposing them to a potential risk of a medicine that would yield them no benefit. Yeah, it kind of takes the Hippocratic Oath and throws it out the window. All right, so here we go. If, however, the evidence objectively shows equivalence in protection, then these civic policies of vaccination and COVID recovered, and the COVID recovered, please forgive me, should be seriously questioned on the basis of medical necessity, ethical principles, and legal precepts governing the maintenance of bodily integrity. I like to call it autonomy, self-determination. But you see, a lot of individuals out there feel like they've been isolated by the scientific community, especially when it comes to autonomy. 
and uh, they may not necessarily disagree with scientists, obviously not necessarily being scientists themselves. However, though, that autonomy and self-determination, when you feel like you've lost it, it has major psychological impacts, which obviously, whether psychological, ends up being biological. So to reiterate, if, however, the evidence objectively shows equivalence in protection, talking about individuals which have naturally have been exposed prior, then these civic policies of vaccination and the COVID recovery should be seriously questioned on the basis of medical necessity, ethical principles, and legal precepts governing the maintenance of bodily integrity. Now, let's just scroll down, see what else they came up with. Now, listen to this. Check, check this out. The Pfizer trial received an 8 out of 9 score, because there's the score in the trial, with one star deducted, ready, due to lack of confirming the presence or absence of current or prior infection prior to intervention. Now, you can see the problem there. If individuals which have been exposed prior are part of the vaccine trials, yeah, mm, yeah uh-huh, yep. All right, proceed. Of these previously infected individuals, we're going to the other study, 53% remained unvaccinated during the course of the observation period. Throughout the entire study, not a single previously infected individual was presented with reinfection, regardless of vaccination status. Well, let's see if there's any further excerpts to read through. And again, it will be linked for you as well. Uh, this way, again, my objective is just to bring attention to the information not to do anything else but that. Here it goes. The CDC currently recommends vaccination all individuals 12 and older, regardless of history of previous infection, under the assumption that recovered individuals are still at risk for reinfection and transmission. However, as discussed earlier, the data indicate that this reinfection rate is low, in many cases, zero. From a policy perspective, it is relevant to understand if natural immunity in COVID-recovered individuals provide similar protection from reinfection compared to vaccination in COVID-naive persons. Given the newfound social status, newfound social status of being fully vaccinated, we emphasize that it is highly unadvisable for COVID-naive persons to seek infection as a means to avoid vaccination. So you remember, when I grew up, we used to have measle parties and chicken pox parties. So then, you know, we didn't run and mask and quarantine. We actually invited people over, albeit, you know, you could say draconian and Neanderthal, but you have to understand that's the generation in which I arose. And, there, and many of us arose. Uh, we just said, hey, well, let's get it out of the way now. And the risk of COVID illness, serious or otherwise, far exceeds the risk of vaccination. However, if natural immunity is at least equivalent to some brands of vaccination, da, 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 then any rigid mandate to vaccinate COVID recovered individuals would be of questionable legal and ethical standing on the basis of suspect medical necessity and even a potential for harm. In our systematic review, there was no clear evidence that vaccinated COVID naive individuals enjoyed greater protection than unvaccinated COVID recovered counterparts. In fact, the four observational studies, which we took an excerpt from, and one RCT found that natural immunity provided superior protection to vaccination in the COVID naive. None of the identified studies or pooled groups found a statistically significant advantage to vaccination in the COVID naive population although the RCTs trended in favor of vaccination. Until the other one we just read earlier when we came in. There was actually went the other way. There was a solid internal cons consistency between the conclusions of our pool analysis and the conclusions of the authors of the studies taken individually. Was there anything else? Aha! From review of these studies, we conclude that there is no statistical advantage to vaccination in the COVID naive compared to natural immunity in the COVID recovery. All right, a lot of teachers out there, hospital administrators, so on and so forth, albeit if you should be watching this video, uh, let's have some ammunition here as far as you can now begin to utilize. That's what I like to do. Again, I've heard some of these TikTok videos making fun of people saying, oh, we did our own research. It's not that we're doing our own research or people are doing their own research. Researchers are doing research and they're doing a great job. It is the fact that basically people are reading information, they're reading studies, and the studies from the research in which they're reading 
is somehow different than the research in which our bureaucratic anomalies are reading. To proceed to the next study as follows. Now this is interesting. This, this, this hits home. The vitamin D and socioeconomic deprivation mediated COVID-19 ethic health disparities. I, when the pandemic first broke out, I personally myself went to the health department and said, hey, you know, I can get a large amount of vitamin D out there. This happened last year, obviously. And, and I would like to donate it to a lot of the field workers and, you know, as far as the migrant workers work in the field of my area in Central California. No one, it just fell on flat ears. Now, we were also some of the first people to supply masks when California couldn't get any masks either. We have, um, we uh, ironically, you know, we even did that, but that they took. And then we were able to uh, supply a lot of masks to a lot of hospitals and community hospitals as well, which the state of California failed to on their own for whatever reason, I don't know. But we were the first to do it. So we tried to be proactive in doing this. We tried to be proactive until, we, until more information came out in reference to uh, what was actually occurring in the pandemic itself. And obviously, variants changed, policies changed, information changed, so on and so forth. And But vitamin D, for whatever reason, even though it pops up over and over again, and many individuals attempted to uh, donate uh, nutritional fortification in order to basically mitigate uh, many of the, uh, the transmissibility and also the outcomes of this particular pandemic, falls on deaf ears. No one pays attention, and I don't know why. I'd like this. I mean, seriously, if they were, to me, if they were really serious about ending this pandemic, increasing the nutritional value of the diet of the large section of the population should have been number one of the number one priorities. But no. But here we proceed. Vitamin supplements, including vitamin D, mediate the Asian disparity in COVID-19 susceptibility and serum uh, vitamin D levels. Mediate Asian and Black COVID-19 uh, severity disparity. Severity disparities. Several measures of overall health also mediated COVID-19 ethnic disparities. That word's being used a lot. Underscoring the importance of comorbidities. Our results support ethnic minorities' use of, use of, now I'm having a hard time speaking, use of. Vitamin D is both a prophylactic and a supplemental therapeutic for COVID-19. And this we've known practically from day one. Now, there have been a few studies referenced to vitamin D in COVID-19 Many of them positive, a few negative. The last negative one I saw, what they attempted to do is they tried to give you 200,000 I use of vitamin D all at once. And you know, that's not the same as boosting those vitamin D levels up normally. And last week we talked about vitamin D and UVB levels at the same time. And um, they came out with a positive outcome reference to vitamin D supplementation as well, or vitamin D levels. And let's scroll down. Bop, bop, bop. Wonderful study in reference to the breakdown. And do, 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 do. considered together, these results show that socio socioeconomic deprivation has the greatest impact on COVID-19 outcomes, without a doubt. And policies aimed at eliminating socioeconomic deprivation would do the most to mitigate COVID-19 ethnic disparities. However, policies of this kind are difficult to implement and could take generations to realize their effects. Vitamin D, on the other hand, is a modifiable risk factor that is inexpensive, widely available, and easy to administer. Furthermore, vitamin D has a number of health benefits beyond the effects of COVID-19 measured here. Given the finding that Asian and Black individuals in the UK have lower levels of circulating vitamin D, we recommend that ethnic minorities take vitamin D, which we keep it simple, supplements as a routine method of preventative health care. I would really be curious if you compared, it would be unethical to do, but still. Unless there's individuals which don't want to get vaccinated, and would like to be part of maybe a study to see, for example, if they took vitamin D and they compared it to individuals which were vaccinated that did not take vitamin D, who would have the better outcome? That'd be a real interesting study. Nice, nice study. Vitamin D group, vaccine group, who would have less COVID-19 severity in reference to the medical outcomes? That would be very, very interesting to see. All right, to proceed to the next study. All right, we covered this last week. I'll have the link to the video for those who don't want to watch the weekly videos in reference to saline solution uh, inhibiting replication of SARS-CoV-2. Really, really good research, and that'll be there as follows as well. And that I'll link so you can see it. 
And then effectiveness of vaccination prevented SARS-CoV-2 in South India. We went through that already. Type of vaccine, the number of doses of vaccine didn't have any protective effect against new SARS-CoV-2 infection. However, though, they reduced the severity. So again, observational studies as they stand. Now, there could be a healthy user effect, which is actually elucidated. I don't know if it's in this study or not, uh, where the people which are getting vaccinated tend to be healthier uh, when they come in, and especially considering the fact that you know India tends to have a little bit of poverty out there. So, you know, there could be that confounding. It happened here. What's called it's actually called the healthy user effect, and you'll study the biostatistics. Uh, statistics. All right, but to proceed, and let's see if there's anything else in here. Yep, we went right down the line. But a good study. I'll have the link for you. We covered most of the beginning, but. Uh, uh, we'll come down to that a little bit later on. All right. Oh, actually, won't. I'll have a link for you after we're done. All right. See, well, I'm reading this one right here. I didn't read before. Sorry. Please forgive me. Uh, our study could not find any protective effect of vaccination against COVID-19 infection. The type of vaccine or number of had any effect in the incidence of infection. Um, and then... Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then it goes into other studies that basically they had questions referenced to and so on and so forth. We'll link. All right, here we go. Back to nutrition. Computational systematics of nutritional support vac of vaccination against viral bacterial pathogens and prolegomena. Pro uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce that. In fact, let me come back and get the proper uh, pronunciation. One second. Ah, I cheated. It's prolegomena. So now I can sound smarter. Prolegomena. All right, computational systematics of nutritional support of vaccination against viral and bacterial pathogens as prolegomena to vaccinations against COVID-19. I learned a new word. A total of 6,628 PubMed registered publications in relationship between the effects of vaccination and the provisions of micronutrients have been studied by methods of topological analysis of text data. All right, I read that fast, but you get the gist. Vaccination aims to activate acquired immunity, which implies the production of pathogen-specific antibodies in sufficient concentration. At the same time, vaccination does not, I will reiterate, at the same time, vaccination does not stimulate and does not support the innate, innate viral, antiviral, and antibacterial immunity. For example, analysis of molecular biological pathways involved in innate immunity against the SARS-CoV-2 showed that an increase in the body's supply of vitamins A, D, magnesium, zinc can be an important yet inexpensive resource for enhanced. So this is what gets so annoying. Again, nutritional fortification, nutritional fortification, nutritional fortification uh, plays a huge role, uh, even for the vaccine to work effectively. And we'll get into that in a second. For enhancing the activity of innate immunity and a furon system in particular against RNA viruses. These micronutrients and number of pharmaceuticals can show a direct antiviral effect inhibiting viral replication in cell cultures. The data preclinical and clinical studies suggest that the micronutrient deficiencies adversely affect the functioning of acquired immunity. Micronutrient deficiencies, as we discussed before, and therefore negatively affect the effectiveness and the safety of vaccination. So if you're a drug manufacturer and you want to reduce your vaccine adverse event reporting backlog, then obviously a healthy population which to vaccinate would give you yield you better results. Ironically, unfortunately, or unfortunately, if they're a healthy population to begin with, that can play a huge role onto itself. All right. A new item second, secondly, secondly reported that after COVID nineteen vaccination campaign in Spanish nursing home, all seventy eight residents fell ill. Seven of them died, four were hospitalized. As a result of the use of the same vaccine in Norway, 23 people died. So early comp compensation and micronutrient deficiencies can be promising direction for increasing the effectiveness of safety vaccination against COVID-19. I postulate there was a correlation to that because of the micronutrient deficiencies. And you do recognize a lot of individuals, unfortunately, in long-term care facilities are often not fed the most balanced diets. Did that see that's that would have been an easy thing to do, even if you had a, a nutrient drink per se. Um, you know, I don't care who manufactures it, 
in basically in times like this, when immune compromised individuals uh, can basically fall victim fairly easily, why can't yeah? Well, it would be so much cheaper. The government just subsidized uh, vitamin fortified whatever, so that individuals in nursing and long term care facilities can basically uh, weather through this fairly well, as opposed to waiting for some sort of inoculation or some sort of archaic variolation uh, in order to um, mitigate the pandemic by that time. And then on top of that, then they end up having reactions potentially to the vaccine. It's not a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation if they are taken care of. All right, discussion. This is what vitamin A and vaccination. I'm just bringing your attention to it. Uh, it's a lot of information, but I want to give you an idea of the, the hypothesis that the researchers are alluding to in reference to what could be done to improve the immunological response to the inoculation and or if they're not inoculated, improve the immunological response dietary wise. Is that worthy? Vitamin A and vaccination, beautiful, beautiful. Do you realize you used to add vitamin A to the measles vaccines, uh, especially a lot of the ones used to go to Africa and places like that because that's the vitamin A helped the vaccine work really, really well. But at the same time too, vitamin A and measles and things like that also work well but just to give you an idea. And so it goes through all the different things they went through in reference to vitamin A, the meta-analysis, and so on and so forth. Vitamin D, once again, all throughout the line. And very, very positive, obviously. Folate, another B vitamin groups, uh, in particular folic acid, it looks like more than anything else. B6, B12, so on and so forth. They go through the entire line. Again, I'll have the link so you can go to the study directly on your own. Zinc, we knew about that from the very beginning. Uh, very effective and just I'm not gonna say anything but you know zinc helps with the immune system right and when a person is deficient in zinc what's the first thing they lose taste and smell what an incredible correlation you know, I have to put it directly into words and to proceed selenium as well iron as well iron often gets like the orphan child orphan child orphan child uh, basically when it comes to uh, a lot of nutritional supplementation outside of blood and so on and so forth but here you have with whipping cough and things like that and uh, it's it's a, you know i don't know how it gets left out iron for example and restless leg syndrome if you don't want to talk COVID 19 just as a hint manganese omega-3s and polyunsaturated fatty acids and you go through the hemp the whole line here Beautiful study. Hence, vaccination in such populations without micronutrient support may not only show reduced immune response, but also provoke complications of vaccination. So if you're going to mandate vaccines, if you want to play that game, then wouldn't you want your population to be healthy enough to basically uh, mitigate any potential uh, negative outcomes in reference to that vaccine, regardless of even how small or minuscule it may be, since every life matters? Wouldn't that be kind of nice? Proceeding vaccination with micronutrient supplementation might prevent side effects of the vaccination. Increase antibody teeters against bacterial and viral pathogens and reduce mortality and the severity of pathology in the case of contracting infection. All right, let's say for example this. You're going to vaccinate kids. All right, so what they're like, ah, we want to vaccinate kids against COVID-19. Couldn't you at least you know, when they go into the office, give them a children's chewable or something like that to boost the micronutrient levels, at least for a moment in time. You know, there's so much that can be done. It's so easy to, to be done. It requires a minimal of effort, but uh, just a basic level of compassion and care. So it's not about winning. Oh, look, I won. I got not going to get 12 year olds vaccinated. It's not about winning. I don't, it's not, it is about caring. And if you're truly caring about the health of your subjects and what you basically imply in these mandates, then won't you start from the bottom up? And the bottom up is the basics of nutrition. Make sure they're healthy. And then you can play those other games. But to proceed as follows. Effects of testing and vaccination levels and the dynamics of COVID-19 pandemic prospects for its termination. Kind of a, a sad research article in reference to that, but they're saying, nope, it's going to be endemic. But let's read this highlight. However, existing vaccines do not prevent new infections and vaccinated individuals can spread the infection as intensely as unvaccinated ones. So what they're getting at is NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. 
So again, uh, if the vaccination campaign did not turn out the way it was supposed to, then won't you work towards a nutritional campaign? You know, as far as getting outside, UVB light, you know, a little bit of, you know, dietary improvements, so on and so forth, exercise, uh, all things which have been correlated strongly uh, seem to be far more effective than that. You get my drift? Proceed. All right. Ozonation, public transport. I want to read through this real fast to make it kind of bigger. Bump, 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 bump. One more out of everything else. We covered always a nation prior, but again, just going to keep on doing it over and over again until they actually start incorporating it. A system suitable for buses and aeroplanes. The efficacy of the system has been validated using, well, before we read the headline first. A study shows the effectiveness of ozone as a disinfected agent against SARS-CoV-2 in public transport. Again, if the objective is to reduce transmission, UVC-22 light would have been nice. He could have been nice uh, as far as this affecting in the meantime. Uh, UVC 254 would have been nice. Ozonation would have been nice. Ventilation would have been nice. Uh, all this information was well known way ahead of time, uh, but it has been very slow to be incorporated. Uh, the efficacy of the system has been validated using porcine epidemic uh, diarrhea virus, PED murine norovirus, and surrogates for SARS CoV 2 and your human norovirus. Or norovirus, neurovirus. The results clearly support the use of ozone as an effective measure for the virus inactivation in public transport. In laboratory scale experiments, we achieved inactivation with ozone concentrations at 100 parts per million for 25 minutes at 25 degrees centigrade and 95% relative humidity. In a live test, we achieved the same inactivation efficiency with 55 parts per million ozone, 20 minutes at 32 degrees centigrade and 87% RH, which show the relevance of humidity for inactivation efficiency. And quoting the researcher. So here you have a really, really good, it goes this to what they said here. Point out, even though experiments are carried on a real metro and tram wagons, the procedure that they developed can be extended to other vehicles such as buses and airplanes and to interior spaces and buildings. So imagine when you're flying, they ozonate the plane ahead of time, you get a lot of cushioning and stuff like there that's in the, that binds to tons of formatted activity. And then they have like UVC 22 uh, down to me the lights in there, which could be safely used with people in the arena. And it, and you could just and they have good ventilation and nice HEPA filters and you know silver embedded uh, air filters or whatever it is, both two UVC 254 light on the way. You can make life a lot more pleasant for individuals, and I guarantee you'd be a lot less fights in airplanes, aeroplanes. But to proceed. This we went through. Let's go over that. That was the estimates of da 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 da. Estimates for assumed population immunity SARS CoV 2. And this plays a huge role too because why? All right, and this now comes back to full circle. All right, per percent previously infected. So you have like these states here, large previously infected groups. And that plays a role back into this research article. So if you're a policymaker, and you find that the equivalency of protection from natural immunity in COVID is actually equal, if not superior, then when you look at this, now you can get an idea and go, hmm, is mandating an inoculation uh, necessary in these particular areas if the previously infected is so high? And of course, they give the combination of the two as well, too. But I want to have links on there so you can make your own judgment to reference that outcome. All right, COVID-19 acceleration and vaccine status in France, August 2021. Conclusion, I'm just going to read to you. Our results call for an increasing testing effort for both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals in view of the fact that viral circulation is currently accelerating at similar, similar levels in both groups in France. So what they did is they redid the math in reference to vaccinated and unvaccinated groups. And yeah, this whole night has basically been uh, bringing into question the efficacy. If anything, it brings into question of the vaccines potentially being oversold and overpromoted. And a lot of bureaucrats basically just uh, the fighting the wrong battle. Let's put it that way. And if you're a researcher or a scientist, um, it at least gives you an opportunity to take pause uh, before you put true faith in other 
uh, of just the vaccine. The question is, are you putting faith in the vaccine or are you putting faith in the researchers that are researching the vaccine? Interesting. In France, we observed at the end of August 2021, about six times more new positive cases are found among the unvaccinated individuals compared to the vaccinated. This indicates the new infections are much larger for the unvaccinated, but those absolute levels do not correct for the fact that unvaccinated people are tested much more. So you see the trick? That's the, that is, that's the shell game. So what ends up happening is the unvaccinated, and many of us know, for example, those who choose not to be vaccinated here in the United States have to pay weekly for their own test, many of us. So if you're testing the unvaccinated, but you're not testing the vaccinated, guess what type of results you're going to get? You're going to get the unvaccinated to be tested more positive than the vaccinated, but you're not testing the vaccinated. So in a very Boolean logic sense, you get the picture. The difficulty with this conclusion, however, is that a direct comparison relies on the implicit assumption that the positivity rates do not change with sample size. If, for instance, the number of tests of vaccinated would be increased to match those of non-vaccinated, the positivity rate is likely to differ. Their positivity rate is likely to differ. So if you've got to test the vaccinated, as often you test the unvaccinated. Now, the interesting part about it is we go to the other studies. If the vaccine is being oversold and is not resulting in reduction in transmission, but you're not testing people because they are vaccinated, but you're testing the unvaccinated, that's silly. To proceed it forward, ba ba ba, nice math, like math, do 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 do, to go further. The decision of the French authorities, for example, to concentrate mainly on vaccination to combat COVID-19 to make access to antigen testing difficult and costly for individuals, to focus on PCR testing by prescription only, and to impose a vaccine passport that gives certain advantages to vaccinated people, notably to travel and to visit social gatherings without prior testing, is questionable on the grounds that it is not guaranteed to be effective to help curbing sustainably the COVID-19 acceleration that is still observed in France. Because bureaucrats see it about winning and losing. Researchers see about, hey, you know, we have to evolve our thinking here. Um, no. and But regardless of that, they think it's a game that they're going to win. But reality, why? <laughs> For what? To what end? Oh, I got everyone to finally take a mandatory vaccine, and but the vaccine didn't work? Wow, I feel really powerful now. There's a real good, uh, uh, basically, the definition of power, if you ever see the movie called Sin City. And there's a great example of what power truly means. It's not about wealth. And I, somehow I think these individuals, they, they're in this endorphin fix where they don't like being listened to. They feel like they have to social engineer. Regardless of the data, uh, even though we are we are partaking in selection bias here. All right, so keep that in mind because we're choosing data which basically f uh, research that flies in the face of the data of conformity, which forces us in a position for a selection bias. It's kind of like if you want to go buy a new car and you kick the tires. Well, we're kicking the tires while we're doing. Does that make us wrong? No, I don't know. If we discover those tires fall off the car when we kick them, That'd be kind of scary, but just the same. All right, here we go. Next. All right, comparison of adverse events between COVID-19 and flu vaccines. Dun, 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 dun. Let's look right here. Let's go right here. This is a better one. There. All right. What they did is they went through the, the vaccine reactions. What you're showing here is the number of vaccine adverse event reports representing each vaccine. The reason I like this research and to link it for you as well is because it goes into what to look for for each age group uh, between 12 to 15, 16 to 30, 31 to 64, and 65 plus. And what you're reading here, for example, Nick, as compared to the flu vaccine. Now, here's your mortality of the flu vaccine, 0.3, as a percentage of the, the, uh, of the adverse event reports. All right. Here's your, your percentage of deaths as a percentage of the adverse event reports that are reported to VAERS. Now let's go back into here real fast so we don't get censored. Boom, 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 boom. While anyone can report adverse events to VAERS, but healthcare providers and vaccine manufacturers have a certain obligation to report subset and all adverse effects as they become aware to VAERS. Adverse event reports of VAERS database are indicative of a potential association between vaccine and adverse event reports, blah, blah, blah. Uh, past surveillance, anyone can identify safety signals, so on and so forth. Right, we're going to read that again later on too. So here we go. 
So this is has to be confirmed. Now look, <laughs> recovered, no. No, and uh, again, not knowing what these adverse events which they're not recovering from uh, is interesting. But they went through the age groups, and that is reported to. Remember that reported to does not mean it's been validated. Reported to. Uh, but however, though, through all those years of vaccine reports, and you see a point three, it makes the flu vaccine appear safer than rain. You know what I mean? I don't know why I'm bouncing back and forth here. But look at the individuals who did not. Now, as far as not recovered uh, out, of, out of the percentage of reports, you know, pretty similar. Uh, but you do have a higher rate. I don't know why they have unknown there. But, uh, it must have been their self-reporting aspects. Uh, port of hospitalization in reference to the COVID-19 vaccines in the United States as compared to the flu. As you can see, 2.7% compared to, let's just skip this one, 6.2, 4.3, and 5.9, as respectively. So let's go down and see what else is discovered. All right, these are the adverse events that they're looking at. Let's go down. Do, 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 All right, and here we're looking at. All right, use this as your baseline. And anything you're looking at one is 14.44 for weakness. Each vaccine, which is interesting, tends to have different perspective in reference to the adverse events. Now, right here, you look at the top right there, it's age 12 to 15. You see right there? 12 to 15. So 12 to 15, this is what's felt most in the visor. When you see lower confidence interval, upper confidence interval, I just like to stick with the relative risk. So right in the middle there. Uh, even though this is like weird, this 14.44 right there, that's just weird. Up oh, there's my name. Look at that. All right, here goes relative risk. And so that's 12 to 15. As you get older, 16 to 30, you start seeing a crease above with fever, uh, second dose, so on and so forth. You know, it's the Janssen between 16 and 30. Uh, that's a, that's a huge. A, I would I would like to see them use an age group, uh, you know, outside of adolescence, and then um, mucoskeletal pain and so on and so forth down the line. Thirty one to sixty four, uh, adverse events. You know, neuropathy begins to pop up. Let's see if I go here. Maybe I skipped one page. Yeah, I just didn't highlight the pages for the older individuals between thirty one and sixty four because it broke. The the page there, uh, you know, a lot of neuropathy appears to be much greater than the flu vaccine. You get you get the drift, and 65 year old the same thing again. Each vaccine is a little different, but I really want to give this to parents more than anything else, uh, so they can make a rational decision in reference to uh, that. Even though the AstraZeneca, even though it's got its questions from a European scale, from the dose being used in Europe. Things like myocarditis are not appearing under the AstraZeneca one, even though blood clots do, but myocarditis does not, which may be a better fit for individuals of um, younger age. But again, I'm not making any you know recommendation. I'm just saying those reactions don't appear to be appearing in the AstraZeneca as opposed to the Pfizer and so on and so forth. But here we are. Age of 65, person receiving first dose of Pfizer, 1.77 times more likely to experience headache. Uh, central neuropathy, so on and so forth, nausea, vomiting, and down the line. And then 12 to 15, for example, uh, depending on the vaccines, let's go right down here. You get the idea. I'll give you a, a drift as far as what is out there. Each paragraph, for example, have you know one aspect as far as being lighter. Uh, and the other one, when you start seeing 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 it, it brings into question certain efficacy of the vaccine for certain age groups. But that will be a link there for you to follow as well. And yeah, just some freaky stuff happens with a lot of them, regardless of the age. All right, but then there's the, that one, make sure you read the disclaimer. All right, to proceed further, why is it stopping here? Hang on a second. I want to see if I had the one described the neurological conditions in children, 
but I can't seem to see it pop up here. It's going all around the place. Uh, you know, but you could read through it again without giving a, a weird pause to it. All right, to proceed as that, it? nope, that's the 65 again. And now we go into the data analytics as follows. Ba -ba -ba. All right, again, our data source is going to be used in your Dura villages. Endura, 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 Endura villages. We'll be using our world and data. We'll be using VAERS. We'll be using GIS aid. And we'll be using healthdata.gov. And here we go. Ba -ba -ba. Let's go to VAERS. All right, we'll start with that one first. Uh, and then we're going to go to the... Uh, the other ones in a little bit, but hang on. All right, our current reports from VARES reports to VARES are 569,498. So reports meaning people reporting reactions. So let's go to our top right here. All right, and we're just going to skim through it really fast. Server injuries, 4,176. Again, look here for the average age. 15,247 reports of shingles to VARES. Bell's Palsy at 5,921. All these need verification. Please keep in mind. Thrombocytopenia, 3,268. Paralysis by age, 5,042. I believe there may be a subset between Bell's Palsy and paralysis by age. Myocarditis, that's really low. Again, looking at that number there, 5,216. There appears to be the most vulnerable age groups. Thrombosis, 7,942. All right. COVID breakthrough illness by reaction by age, 79,150. Remember, this is for the data analysts out there. Watch out for duplicated VARES IDs. These are the, the uh, they're not offenders. Again, some people have so many symptoms that, you know, when you're looking at this right here, I don't know if you can read it, uh, 4K, it's kind of small, uh, that they require multiple, multiple reports. Unfortunately, they all these reports are filed under one VARES ID. And that can give a, an inflation uh, to the system itself when looking at number of actual reports, meaning it can give you a false uh, number. All right, these are the vaccine reactions by four, Moderna, uh, then Pfizer as far as number of reactions. Then these are all the other vaccines, as you can see. Let's see, reaction by ages. Again, this is numerical, not a percentage. Uh, mortality that has been reported to is 6,965. So these has to be confirmed. All right. Those are different weeks as far as mortality, which seems to be really kind of eerily consistent. Uh, I would expect to see up and down, but it's pretty, no, no, pretty normalized. All right. This is throughout, that's the up and down, mortality, mortality. Let's go keep on going. Bop, bop, bop. Uh, this, this is, you ready for this? This is reported vaccine reactions all of 2020, right there, compared to up to the day, 2021. Again, that's 569,498 reports to VARES, compared to 57,115 of all of 2020. And we actually get this done within an hour. Here we go. Keep it down to 10. This is the word cloud. I'm going to go right past that. Top 30 reported. I'm going to make this a little smaller. All right. We may bounce around a little bit, so please bear with me. All right. Top 30 reported symptoms by age. Oops. There it goes. There. Uh, I got to take that as a stop word. Please forgive me. Back pain, chest discomfort, meaning the condition aggravated is not a condition. Headache, fatigue, chills, dizziness, pain, nausea, so on and so forth. Down the line, these are what's most common reactions. And obviously, this is the x-axis, the number of times it's been reported. Two, uh, mortality. These are the most often uh, pulse absent. That's mortality. Uh, again, look at COVID-19. It's catching up real fast in COVID-19 pneumonia. So these breakthrough infections, whatever they are, um, appears to have some sort of aspect in reference to mortality. And you can go down the list right there. So individuals who are reporting death to VARES, these are the most common symptoms that accompany that fatal diagnosis of death. Proceed.
age of minors. Um, minors reactions, these are lot numbers. If there's any problems per se, those are the ones with the most. It's not a good representation if you look at this because they don't know the percentage or how large that lot was. All right, so we go down the line. This is children. Most common reactions that children report right there. Let's see how it turned up. We're both looking at this at the exact same time. Chest pain is right here. Fatigue, headache, and dizziness. And basically, now if you look at chest pain, let's see, looking at the symptoms in children, chest discomfort, see reaction protein increase, the part of inflammation, and so on down the line. Chest x-ray, again, it's not a symptom. That's just what they basically uh, wanted to diagnose or brought, brought it into the play. All right, let's see what else we had here. Dun, dun, dun. All right. And let's go down the list. All right, don't worry, that's all information for me, so let's pass on to the next one. All right, I'm going to go to the mutations first. All right, a lot of people have questions in reference to mu. So I'm going to go backwards on this chart here. So let's start with the, um, let's go right down to here. Oops, we're right down to here. If I could find where here was. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Where is my chart? Here we are. All right, here we go. All right, nice color green here. Most people are looking for mu. Let's see what happened with mu. All right, so right now, the latest report is September 20, 2021. What you're seeing right here is primarily delta. So if I click on delta right here, these are the latest people reports the variants of concern. All right, so if we go to mu, let's click on mu again. We're really looking at basically the latest reports. Spain is 1.32% of all sequences caught. United States, it's 0.23. Outside of that, everything is pretty much Delta. So we go down here, let's keep an eye on Columbia. Because I know there's been a lot of talk about mu. So mu variant, for those not familiar. So Columbia went from 76.83 on mu then Columbia went to 62.64 on mu. Then, look at all the variants in that one. Then Columbia went to 48.48% of the sequences of mu. And I think that was the last report from Columbia. And then in the United States here on mu was 0.14. 023 so if you're trying to get a, a bearing on mu, let's see, Spain right here is, Spain is, if I can get to Spain, 0.08, so 1.32. Mu seems to be there. I know a lot of people are concerned with mu because it evades about everything. It makes, makes you know, it's far more infectious than um, detrimental to the vaccinated as opposed to um, Delta. Let's put it that way. But it, it seems to just, it's not consistent in its growth. And so, I don't know. I mean, it looks like it's declining and, you know, going Columbia itself. It began to make an impression a little bit. And then, you know, then it just, it, it's waning. So I don't know how exactly how much attention to pay to Mew. But there's mu for you as far as looking at all the variants as a whole. And was mu, yeah, mu existed. Yeah, mu has just been one of those persistent in Columbia for quite some time. All right, but let's look at the other mutations as follows. All right, we are going to be doing is looking at mutation to vaccination. All right, we'll go through our, basically, our heat map here. You're not seeing anything. No correlation, negatively or positive, with a very, very, very basic correlation formula. Uh, one way or the other, you have a 0.69 there, and that is, you know, weekly ICU emissions, new case is smooth, which makes sense. 0.93, uh, hospital emissions, the ICU emissions, that makes sense. Uh, do you see anything else per se? Maybe if you see it and I don't, but again, not seeing really any solid 0.69, no, we just spread that. Uh, that's the other, uh, I you know, other side of the correlations matrix, but nothing dramatic, you know. So again, I'm not seeing. Remember, we did this with face masks and social distancing and MPIs. 
and we ne never saw any strong correlation of effectiveness of any of them. And with same thing here, but again, this is a weak correlation matrix. So again, you can use Kendall, Spearman, Pearson, whatever. And, but here we go. People fully vaccinated per 100 correlated to cases per million. That we do notice, all right? So 0.88 total cases per million to people fully vaccinated per 100. Uh, correlated to new death smooths, we know that. That could be a correlation, we don't know. All right, now keep this in mind. That line right there, once again, the fully vaccinated countries. In fact, I'm going to do expediency of time. And we'll go with this next week. But I want to go back to our primary synopsis. It referenced the countries and referenced the vaccines uh, and um, reproduction rates and so on and so forth. Because obviously right there, again, this is the countries which have 60 or more per 100 individuals vaccinated uh, compared to, for example, countries between 40 and 50. And if we go down to oddly even further down the line, that it gets further and further away. And until we get to do, 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 between 10 and 20 per 100 vaccinated, the case per million continuing to drop. Then we get down to, 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 to up to 10. And now keep in mind, now a part of the confounding that may play a role of being a devil's advocate could be the fact is maybe the countries now we that we we isolated populations of 5 million or more with a human development index of 0.64 or greater. And so we wanted to compare apples to apples, but the average age may be a lot less. And if you have mortality, for example, of, let's see which one right here. Uh, well, we'll come back to that in a second. Maybe I have it up here. If you have mortality, for example, of, let's go to the top here. There is it, of 85 and older, but life expectancy is below 85, then that can explain maybe why you have such a lower rate of, um, how would you say, cases or mortality. You get what I'm saying. All right, but let's go down to the synopsis here. Do, 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 so 60 to 100 obviously has the highest total cases per million. Those countries which vaccinate the most have the most cases. Those countries which vaccinate the least have the least cases. You can read into it what you want. Deaths per million, well, that's where the vaccinated did beat the almost non-vaccinated, 0.78 to 0.89. In between here, no clue what's going on. But you could see the data there as far as Accumulated, again, maybe, you know, there could be confounding involved. The average age in these countries could be much higher than the average age in these countries. We'll break that down maybe next week. We'll see what comes up with that. Reproduction rate? Yeah, that kind of speaks for itself. Because maybe the South India study is right in reference to 1.2 times positivity rate in reference to the vaccine vaccinated individuals or not. Maybe there is statistical significance if a larger group is run that may be found. From an observational standpoint, I mean, there could be confounding involved. I would love to see someone look into it. But, you know, reproduction rate is pretty low uh, in uh, countries which are not really vaccinating. Case is smooth per million. Yeah, that could explain the reproduction rate. <laughs> it's like, wait a second. What's happened here? 252.2? I have no clue, but it seems to be like, whoa. But then, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. From the data aspect of what we have available here, I, from, from an observational point only, what would you think? How effective would you think uh, inoculation has been, heavy inoculation in those populations? Albeit, this shows it to be a strong correlation. But if I wasn't so low on all those numbers in reference to the countries which have a very low per 100 vaccination rate, I don't know. Again, it's I'm, I'm not here to conclude anything or think for anybody. All right, 10-week trends varied in the United States. Delta, obviously, is the highest. 
Deaths per million in the United States, about six per million. Positivity rate in the United States, 0.1. Uh, fully vaccinated in the United States, a lot. There we are. India. People, deaths per million, almost non-existent. Positivity rate, not really there. People fully vaccinated, not really motivated. Sweden, remember, a country of no lockdowns or very little lockdowns or pandemic mitigation factors. Delta's at the top there too. Deaths per million, about 0.6 compared to United States. Shut school down and everything else like that, six. Can you say dysbiosis? That's what I think it's been, dysbiosis. And it's because people, you just, I mean, when uh, we dealt with submariners in Groton, Connecticut, and you talk to any basically submariner that's in a submarine for like three months period of time, particularly what's called an SSBN, a ballistic nuclear missile carrier uh, sub. And, uh, and so they may be down for three months, six months, who knows how long. And then they come up and the second they open that hatch, they start getting sick because they've been not exposed to those elements. And submariners know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, here's that. And so people fully vaccinated Sweden. And this is the positivity rate. Sweden, about 0.04 positivity rate. The United States is 0.11, I would say. Yeah, so everyone that really didn't do what we did seemed to be doing better. All right, and that's for that one. And let's go down the line. Let's go to COVID rebuild. So look at the states. All right, mortality. Those are ages. Life expectancy, I think the United States is 77 something. And so here's our mortality. I know you hear a lot of, uh, about, you know, unfortunately with children, but that's the age groups which are succumbing most often. Delta please is rendered in 4K by the time you see it. And you can see the vulnerability of those particular age groups compared to the higher age groups. All right, and I'm just going to go down real fast because we're still low on time. Do, 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 do. All right, deaths per 100,000. There we are. Right there, averaging basically up there 3.65 per 100,000. And so if we look at the past four weeks, we're right about there. So it's been getting higher. We look at year to date, that's where it happens. You seem to have a natural ebb and flow. Now think about this. May 2020, how many vaccines did we have? None. So how in the world, with all this technology and medical care and everything else like that, have we got become worse than we were back from May 2020? Think about that. And that's why I'm not really impressed. I mean, I know a lot of the individual data in reference to inoculation seems to be fairly positive, without a doubt. But something is on the real world scale, and obviously different variants and things like that, um, tend to um, cause different results. All right, scrolling down, do, do, do. And we're just gonna look at this way. I should make these lines bigger up. I covered up Florida. This is, let's look at the year to date. All right, here we are. And this is each state, Florida, gosh darn it. And there, look at Florida. You see this right there, that drop? Now, what we're gonna do, this is Texas right here. I promise I'll make this uh, more legible, I should say, next time. So let's go to just this week. Look at this. So I'm going from September 16th to today, which is about September 25th or 26th. Look how fast Florida dropped. So look at the four-week rate. Look at that. That's a four-week rate in Texas, New York, and then California. What happened? You heard me say this last time. What happened in Florida? We all of a sudden you had this massive, massive drop to where basically you're looking at almost the exact same level as New York. So New York's at 0.87. Florida's at 1.26 deaths per 100,000. And Texas, 
Texas has got a lot of different issues going on, so I don't know if I should even include Texas. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, yeah, think about that. So that's your comparison between New York, Florida, California, New York, and Texas. And this is how they fared the entire time if you want to average it out. And I think that one's that one. And then mutations we covered. Oh, yes. The, let's look at uh, Europe real fast. The Endura Vig Vigilance thing. Endura Vigilance. All right. So this is what we have here. Endura Vigilance. Endura, Endura Vigilance. Serious events. 436,352. And AstraZeneca is the highest level there. We don't have AstraZeneca in the United States, but that's what it is. And again, I think there's been over a billion doses of AstraZeneca given around the world. So I don't know how it compares to the amount of Pfizer being utilized in Europe and European Union. Uh, number of total events to your Duravigilance, your Dura 979,544. Now of this, now keep this in mind, this is serious events right there, 436,052 reported to Endura Vigilance. It's the same, the same disclaimer as Vera's, just reports to. This is total reaction reports. So Pfizer has more reactions uh, than AstraZeneca, just that the reactions from AstraZeneca are, tend to be more serious as being reported to Endura Vigilance than Pfizer. So it's a give and take. Uh, now remember this last week, it was 11,000, and also they jumped up to 15,566. So I don't know why, what happened last week as far as pulling the data, but yeah, now they're more fatal designation, designation submitted in the reports to Endura Vigilance is at 15,568. And these are the most common terms that are associated with the fatal, fatal designation. And so you wanna look at that. All right, so, and that's the word cloud as well. So to cover it up for the cover it up, to cover it all, that's like conspiracy theory. To cover it all for tonight, our databases was healthdata.gov, GIS.data, DVERS, our world and data, European database. The studies that we covered, in which I'll have links for all of them, were equivalency protection from natural immunity and COVID-19 reverses fully vaccinated persons, systematic review and pooled analysis. Vitamin D, obviously from the top, as far as with basically all the groups. And to give you an idea, in reference to the um, aspect Look at this. This is the vitamin D levels between ethnicity. And so this can be a pretty strong correlation, not necessarily causal correlation into basically uh, nutritional mitigation strategies to help people. All right, to proceed as follows. And then study reveals, well, I'll have the link for that. There's a video. If you didn't get a chance to see it that I did last week, we can go to the saline solution. There I am. There's a title. That's even better. All right, effectiveness of, we opened up with this one. Effectiveness of SARS CoV 2 issues, health in the hospital based study. Um, ba -ba -bom. This is a great one in reference to basically the nutritional aspects. Compute, computational, compute, prolegibina, vaccinations. Computologies get what I'm talking about. We'll cover that one again. Computational statistic, nutritional support of vaccination against violent path, bacterial pathogens. And then, Effective testing vaccination levels on the dynamics of COVID-19 pandemic prospects for termination. Not very good. I'm uh, not very good prospects. Uh, but they predicted it was gonna be endemic from like day one. Ozonation, basically the formula for ozonation, utilizing that they used and be really great if we started doing it. Um, basically the estimations of people which have been previously infected and those have been vaccinated and the combination between the both per se. If you want to look at that data, unfortunately, some large states um, are missing or have insufficient data, shockingly. But I'll have a link for that, and that's mainly for bioinformatics or epidemiologists. Uh, COVID-19 French study, in reference to that, that'll be the link as well. Uh, as far as testing individuals vaccinated and non-vaccinated, uh, as far as positivity, it is basically what it came to the conclusion was. You're testing the non-vaccinated more often, and henceforth, you're going to have a higher positivity in the non-vaccinated once you try testing the vaccinated for once or more. There we go. And then comparison of adverse events between COVID-19 and flu vaccines. We'll have that link there. And then that is it for tonight. Gratitude, gratitude to the researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. I know we have a very, very small viewership, but still, I like it that way as far as because it's cool. And it gives me more opportunity to, to uh, address and 
you know, come look for the research that basically is pertinent to um, those which are more data oriented as opposed to sensationalism that there's plenty of infotainment for and where infotainment can be fine, but we shouldn't be basing life decisions upon infotainment. But again, gratitude to all sides in reference to basically the medical information that we've uh, obtained. Uh, fact checkers, again, all the links will be there for you to follow in order to basically validate, which is more than which is more than welcome to. Any questions in reference to uh, checking the facts, please uh, just make a comment or email me. It's perfectly fine as well too. Gratitude, thank you humbly as always, and look forward to you all next week. See you next time. All right, bye.